steroids. Do we need to do anything to sink it? I don't know, that's a good question. I'll just clap in case. Yeah. And I'll clap in case. <laughs> that probably did you nothing. Celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good start. It was yeah. a good start, yeah. Nice celebration of this moment. All right, let's get started. Yeah. I guess. This. Cool. So welcome everybody who it might be watching this, listening to this. Um, uh, so this is a kind of a weird, uh, funny, lovely uh, meeting of two... Hmm, how to call it? What are you? An entity of film? Let me begin by asking you what you are. So th because this will be sent um, at Campfire Stories to the Campfire Stories audience who don't necessarily know who you are. And it will be sent from the Happen Films base camp to your viewers who won't necessarily know who I am. Um, so what, who, who are you? What do you, what's, can you describe Happen Film? Happen Films? Yeah. <laughs> so we're, I'm Jordan, this is Antoinette, um, and we are Happen Films. We're a, a filmmaking duo who make um, short films and feature films about ways that we can make change in our lives to live more sustainably, be more resilient, um, and yeah, what we can do in the face of some of these big issues like climate change. Yeah, solutions focused filmmakers. Yeah. I like to, I like that kind of concept, I like to highlight that concept that we're really solutions focused. Nice. Yeah, so I've been a fan of yours for quite some time now, probably two, three years or something. And how did we find each other? I think we, it was some sort of... I messaged you on Facebook. I came across the Campfire Stories Facebook page and I was like, oh, there's someone else in this space doing a similar <laughs> thing. And <laughs> they also love Charles Eisenstein. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just... Well, like we were talking about this um, the other day of that there's, we've, there's a small group of people that we know who are kind of in this space making these films, but... Um, it's a small network, but it's definitely growing, and it's always lovely to connect with someone who's also blending film and, I guess, activism and trying to inspire people to create a better world. Mm. Nice. Can we, just to set the tone and to begin, uh, before we get into I wanted to ask about your current projects, I want to ask you have all kinds of questions. Uh, for you, but just to set the tone, can you describe where you are? Like, what what are we seeing here, uh, as far as the, the 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 space interior, and where is it located, and and what mm. are you doing for the rest of the day, and just to, <laughs> so we get a little sense for for your a, a snippet of your life. Yeah, mm. so we're in Little River, beautiful little town called Little River, which is um, on Banks Peninsula, on the east coast of the South Island of New Zealand. <clears throat> so um, we're really, really lucky. We live in a uh, we live in a shed, <laughs> um, which has been beautifully retrofitted by our landlords who live on the same property, and um, it's a it's maybe fifty or sixty square meters, um, and it's it's just just been really beautifully um, designed and retrofitted for you know it's a small space that's really functional, and um, we've got you know just this lovely kitchen dining area and we've got a mezzanine upstairs which is our office. We've got a spare bed, we haven't had a spare bed for years because we've been living in tiny houses so we can have guests which is lovely and when people come to stay they always say wow it's like being on holiday which I try to remind myself of when we're on a deadline or when things are really busy. So, like you live in the country with a beautiful view just pretend you're on holiday. <laughs> so it's a, yeah, it's a beautiful um, spot on a hillside looking out over a lovely valley. Hmm. Yeah, and it's, um, yeah, yeah, we can grow some food. We've got a few garden beds out the front in a really small kind of yard area. We've got a composting toilet. We're off grid. And yeah, it's a, it's a nice setup for us. Yeah, yeah we're, we're about 50 minutes from um, a major city, the city that I grew up in, Christchurch which is about 450,000 people. So we go in about once a week. So, so this is kind of, we're 24-7 we're working and living together. So it's a pretty intense um, relationship. And so being in a really beautiful space is, um, yeah, just 
makes life a little bit easier. We we we, we were twenty four seven in a twelve meter square shipping container for quite a while. That was a fairly intense <laughs> period in our life. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, nice. yeah, lovely spot. Yeah, we mm. have a nice lifestyle. We're lucky. Mm. And so, and right now it's it's about nine a.m. in New Zealand, and I'm yes. in Sweden, and it's about nine p.m. here. Uh, so it's a 12 hour time difference and we're speaking over a video link and then we're filming you guys are filming yourselves i'm filming myself hopefully by the time anybody hears this it'll be nicely put together um <laughs> but in case anybody's wondering like what how are they what's going on so there's uh it's looking at computer screens here um <laughs> we're living in the future basically we yeah. really are <laughs> this is very modern yeah there was a TV show when I was a child and they had uh, like a TV screen phones and I was like, yeah, that's never going to happen. <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> Living in the future. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Maybe one day we'll meet in person. Yeah. See, this, so this is interesting because you've made a decision not to, uh, to fly less or not to fly and we've also made a decision to fly less. George's family's in Australia. Mm. But it's really, you know, like we've developed this, we've established this really beautiful connection with you and there's always that underlying knowledge that's never really been there in the past that we'll probably never meet in person or possibly never meet in person it's that that's another kind of um for us that's another way of um thinking about like the future the modern world is yeah like it's a very different um conception of how we live in the world isn't it yeah it's it's more local and more global maybe yeah more, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. All right, I, I'd like to, to dive in and I have, uh, I, uh, so you've, for how long has Happen Films been around? When did you begin? We're, we're just about to have our fifth birthday next month. So uh, in 2015, uh, we began Happen Films. Well, I, I began Happen Films and then halfway through the year, Antoinette um, joined me. Uh, we met on a documentary project. It was my first documentary. It's called A Simpler Way and that's up on our channel for free. It's a feature film and part of that project was involved getting uh, nine people together to live in a community for a year and I was going to film it and we were all going to live together, develop community, build tiny homes, grow our own food. Um, change the world. Change the world and provide uh, maybe like an example of how to live within a one world footprint. So what would, what could a lifestyle look like if we consume the resources that one planet is able to provide? That was kind of the, the outline. Mm. Um, and really challenging year. Yeah, yep, it was a <laughs> challenging year on many fronts. Um, I'd never made a documentary before, so. <laughs> No one involved in the project no. had ever made a documentary before. No. No one had any experience. It was all working it out as we went along. Yeah. And somehow at the end of it, a film came out of it. and um, Which has had really great yeah. views on, it's over a million, yeah. million views on YouTube. And it's had really, we just had an email yesterday from a, a climate change conference in the UK wanting to show it. And mm. it's still, you know, being shown in, in community screenings around the world. So it's, yeah, it's nice to have jumped into a project like that with with no background, no learning and no um, idea how it's going to come out. And what came out of it was kind of really happen films and mm. um, an awesome community and a, a, a beautiful new network and our relationship. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And for me, it was such a life changing experience because I had never heard of basically any of the things that we were uh, trying to embody during that year and, and demonstrate. I'd never heard of permaculture. I'd never heard of you know peak oil, these kind of energy issues. And it was an amazing opportunity because um, I got to interview people like Nicole Foss, like David Holmgren, these academics who are speaking these, uh, speaking about these big concepts. And I was getting this, this firsthand knowledge and as well as the practical experience of building tiny homes out of recycled materials and um, growing food using permaculture methods. And it was just like a big mind blowing um, experience for me. I moved out of my parents' house to go live in my van initially, but then I got a tiny house, which was much appreciated during winter. Mm. But yeah, for me, it was um, a huge 
personal experience, a life-changing experience, but also it's where Happen Films really found its voice and uh, style. Mm. Yeah, I saw that film. Uh, I thought it was really great. I, I, it's hard to, it's hard to believe that it was the the first film you ever made and that you didn't really know what you were doing because it looked like you knew what you were doing and it was really inspiring. <laughs> but it so, was it you. was edited by a professional. Yeah, so. yeah. The <laughs> only person who knew what he was doing was the editor, which probably right. saved it in the end, really. Right. Um, and I don't. I haven't watched it in a couple of years. I don't know if I could now. You had to watch it. I again had to go to a day. screening recently, and it was pretty. Yeah, cringy. I mean, you're in it, so that's, that's another <laughs> yeah, level Yeah, I'm in of it, which is worse, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's always hard to look back at your work, even though like it still gets amazing comments and people are still screening it and love it. It's it's always hard to look back at your own work. I mean, you probably feel the same, is that you've, you feel like you've grown so much and you would do things differently then, and it's you realise all these things that you didn't realise back then when you were making it, so it's always a bit like, ooh, that's what, you, what, what What are you talking about? I love all of my work. <laughs> <laughs> it's just us then <laughs> so so it began five years ago with this film and since since then how many films have you made how many interviews have you made we've made about hmm. 20 short films ranging from kind of five to 20 minutes we've made two feature films so a simpler way was one and our others called living the change and we've made one half hour documentary called Fools and Dreamers, which was our big project for last year. And we've done mm -hmm. a lot of interviews. We've yeah, done, I mean, obviously there's also a lot of interviews yeah, that haven't made it yeah. into a film yet or might not. So, so yeah, it's been a very intense five years. Hmm. Yeah, it, it can feel like we haven't achieved that much yeah. in a way. Like we, we release a film every couple of months at the moment, which we're trying to improve um, by bringing more people on board. But you know, when you hear about the state of the world and you read new reports that come out and you, you feel a bit despairing and you feel like, am I doing enough? You know, we need to put out more. We need to make a film that's going to change the world, the film that's going to mm. <laughs> inspire people to really change. And it can feel a real sense of urgency, which isn't really helpful to the creative process, I don't mm. think. No. So it's a kind of a balance between needing needing to give the creative process its time, but then also, um, yeah, trying trying to tell as many stories as we can and, and mm. um, I guess, yeah, get the message out there that we're trying to. Mm. Mm. So if you look back at, at before Happen Films began um, and you look at today, what are some things that you've learned through all of these maybe hundreds of interviews, I'm guessing here, but many interviews mm. with um, mm. presumably uh, enlightened people, or not presumably because I've seen most of your films and I know that there's some, some really um, knowledgeable people that, that you've interviewed. Mm. What are some things that you've learned about, about the world or about how to go about trying to uh, make less of a, a footprint or, or live more in harmony or, or just be more sane mm. in, in this world, in this chapter? <laughs> To me, it feels like a, um, I go through peaks and troughs of, of despair and hope. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, when we're, when we're spending a lot of time at home uh, in the editing stages of, of a film, I can go, at, or research, I can go through stages of despair. And then when we're out interviewing people, I go through stages of hope because the people that we interview are so inspiring and so um, kind of energised and motivated in general to, um, well, with their message. Um, we had, so I, ca I came into it with um, with a bit more of a background than George, so I, I, I'd already had my kind of epiphany uh, in, I think in 2007, and, and my, my course had cha started changing then. So I was on, a, I was on my journey, and um, there's, there have been a couple of interviews where, uh, where, I've, where it's just where I've come away and gone wow that was that's just um, switched things again for me one was um, with a woman that we interviewed for a um, documentary living the change um, and she's a um, mechanical engineer, mechanical engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and she was talking about um, she was talking about energy and I was still very much in that techno optimist I wouldn't have called it that at the time but I was a techno optimist so I did really feel that um, 
you know, that having solar panels and an electric car and, yeah. um, you know, all of this technology was, was actually going to save the day. And I came away from that interview understanding that it wasn't, um, that it wasn't going to be a magical thing um, like that. And that, and that was, um, yeah, that was one of those moments where it's like, oh, wow, I have to rethink everything <laughs> again. <laughs> was, that, um, was that, sorry to, uh, to chip in here, but uh, was, was that the woman who said something that we have to go back to uh, like, um, like in the 60s and 70s? That's the sort of level of consuming that we have to go yeah. return to? Yeah, I the like 1950s. That. That, that has stuck yeah. with me, or the 50s. Yeah. Yeah. That that comment mm. really has stayed with me. Yeah. No. That, I mean, exactly. Uh, and it's it's little things like that 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 really you know when when something like that really stays with you, um, and it it might not even feel like a, a a a big moment at the time, but I think that's one of the most important things that we do as storytellers is um, those little. Um, comments or moments that just really stick with you and might not change your life in the moment. In that case, it was for me. It was quite a shift. So I really made some some I made some really important mental shifts. Um, but but um, yeah, that that notion of going back to the fifties because often t- techno optimists um, are, are really grumpy with you when when you suggest that technology might not save the day. And there's this there's that really common comment, um, you know, oh, well, what are we going to do? Go back and live in caves. <laughs> and so those are the two options. Yeah. Either we have <laughs> hyper technology <laughs> or you, we go back to being cavemen. Yeah. And it's such, a, it's such a narrow-minded viewpoint, but it was really important that she says that, you know, we need to go back to the 1950s. The 1950s feels very, well, I'm 45, so I wasn't born in the 1950s, but it, was, it feels close. In the um, in the scheme of things, it feels doable. It feels manageable, and it actually feels quite appealing yeah. when you you know when you really research it and think about it and think about and look into how people were living in the 1950s. I think I think there's a lot that was happening in the 1950s that I wouldn't want to go back to as well. I mean, there was that was a that was the shifting time. Um, mm. But yeah, what what a what a much more positive sort of inspiring and hopeful way of thinking about it. Mm. Yeah. It's almost like um, it's, it's a shift in kind of attitude rather than needing yeah. to wait for something to be invented. Mm. I think that's, um, that's a big thing. And a big message in our films is that <clears throat> we don't need to wait to start making change. And for like, someone else to... For, someone, it's for the government to, you know, make change or for businesses to invent the right thing, the right products. We're, we're all about, like, how individuals and communities can can create change, be more resilient, and how that we feel is is where the um, where the movement is going to grow and where the groundswell for change will come from. Mm. Mm. Um, I don't have any uh, or much hope that it's going to come from top down if we look at the governments around the world today. Um, so where else is it going to come from? And mm. that's that's from the bottom up. But you know, technology, of course, will play a role it's I think it's just an important discussion of like what role is that going to play mm. rather than kind of taking for granted that we're humanity's on this trajectory trajectory of growth and progress and soon we'll be on Mars and we can abandon this earth because we ruined it and we better start again somewhere else <laughs> like um, there's got to be some middle ground mm. I think I hate that idea that the Mars idea yeah I'm like yeah. Maybe we should stay on the place where we have millions of years, literally millions of years of getting used to the place uh, of, mm. uh, you know, having our body function with the chemicals that are around and this uh, uh, oxygen thing that we, are, you know, seem to s- seems to work well for us. The water thing, you know. Yeah. 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 It's almost like the it's like the epitome of separation, like even thinking that we could survive, like Maybe technologically, one day, if, if the you know, forget any like limits to growth or <laughs> progress or anything. Say one day we could live on Mars. Mm. Like I wouldn't want to. I'd rather die here on Earth. I think because, mm. like, I'm not going to go live in the middle of the desert. Like, why would I want to live in a bubble on Mars in this artificial environment where I don't think, without being surrounded by other living things. I don't see how humans can have a healthy existence by right. being these kind of solitary um, creatures on a planet that 
isn't our home and it isn't in that web of life that we've evolved to be in. Mm -hmm. I just don't, hmm. sure we might be able to survive, but I don't know, is it, is it a lifestyle that we want? Right. Is, it, is, it it, is, is that it the is, future we want? It is the ultimate in disconnection. I remember reading a book when I was in my early teens, which was um, set in the future, and I loved fantasy and I love future, you know, anything sort of, I love the idea of taking a pill and it would taste like a roast and, you'd, and a whole roast meal and you wouldn't have to eat anything else, you know. Th these notions... I still like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and um, this this world was uh, this was a world in which everyone lived in, in domes because um, you know obviously we we'd ruined the the world and we couldn't live in nature anymore. And I loved the notion of it. I loved the I loved the world that that also created. Mm. But I, I look back on that now and think, uh, thank goodness I've become a person who recognises that I that I am not. I'm not a human being of planet Earth unless I'm living in nature and li living. Well, I am. I am nature. Mm. And to 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 enclose yourself in a dome, um, yeah, you're no you're no longer really what you were born to be. Yeah. Uh, but but so when I so when when I hear people talking about going to live on Mars, I, I kind of think of them as my 13 year old self. <laughs> you know, like it's such an immature, disconnected, mm. separated. Um, undeveloped mindset and it makes me sad that there are people in positions of real power who really are actually creating the possibility of that yeah. happening who are, who have that mindset it's yeah you can almost feel uh, i guess kind of sad for for that mm. that viewpoint because that that's a symptom of you know not feeling connected mm. to the land to the earth mm. and that's got that's got to have some you know hollowness within within those people and I mean within all of us I guess because none of us are or maybe apart from indigenous people like we're or well, I feel so disconnected to the land really which is something it's been a huge shift in in all this over the last five years is trying to reconnect and I think is a huge part of all the change that needs to happen but yeah to to feel like we can do without those relationships I think is a mm. I don't know it's, it's a sad viewpoint mm. Yeah. yeah, but there's some similarity when I hear you talking about living uh, in a bubble world. Um, it's sort of I, I used to live in New York. I lived there for for 13 years, and um, not that I was uh, just uh, uh, staying in my apartment all the time. But I mean, you could literally just stay in your apartment and order in food and order like anything could be brought to you. And I feel like yeah. maybe I'm wrong here, but I, I feel like there are people who. Uh, who, who sort of live that bubble lifestyle already, it, mm. but and that for them maybe wouldn't be such a, so drastically different to do that on Mars. Yeah. So maybe for some people yeah. it's the, the yeah it's I feel like maybe it's not until you begin to have a relationship with nature for real that you start to to understand what it is to be human. Mm. And I think that's at the core of our issues is the fact that so many of us are, I mean, I know because I was so completely um, disconnected from um, what, what I feel now is kind of how we're supposed to live in the world. Yeah. And I, it's not, I'm not saying that cities are a, a bad thing and it shouldn't exist because I actually think that it's, um, you can create a really beautiful form of resilience and com community in a, in a city in a way that it's actually quite hard, can be quite hard to do in the country. Um, and 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 it would be silly to think of a world that didn't have cities, or to or to try and sort of dream of a world that didn't have cities now, but um, but I think I think we can still create that we can still reconnect as city dwellers, um, but I but I think the 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 core issues that we're dealing with, you know, uh, globally have to do with that disconnection that so many of us um, are experiencing knowingly. Un unknowingly. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Did you find that when you were in New York? Did you uh, did you feel like you needed to get out, or like I'm interested to hear how that shift happened for you? Uh, I mean, it was actually really, really great. Uh, I moved there when I was 21, so um, from 21 to 35, I lived there, and and what a great time in your life as a young person to start to realize who you are and who other people are and to be in this uh, city that sort of has everything and there's cultures from 
every corner of the globe represented in the restaurants and music. And I really, really, it, it was double because I really, really loved it. But at the same time, I also felt um, like this is not for real. <laughs> something mm -hmm. like something felt weird and I couldn't put my finger on it. And but I was just having such a good time that I wasn't really asking those questions. And I wasn't really um, into politics or uh, I mean, I cared about the nature and I, I cared about the earth, but not actively. I cared more about I guess I was in that developmental stage where it's like, who am I in this world? So that was more important. And then mm. and I was working as a fashion photographer. <clears throat> I say that now with uh, a little bit of shame almost. At the time, it was like the coolest thing that you could say like at a party, like, what do you work with? I'm a fashion photographer in New York. <laughs> Today, it's like, oh, but I have to I have to own it because that's what it was. Yeah. Um, and but but I was as so I was a photo assistant first. Um, and we were doing all these photo shoots with supermodels and it was very glitzy and, and fancy on the surface. And, um, and then when I went on my own as a photographer, I was really surprised to find that I, I got a lot of work and I was hired and I was able to be a photographer also um, in my own right. And so I was caught up in the glitziness of that uh, and, and in the idea of that. And then when I started to realize that oh, so this is who I am now, or not who I am, but this is what I work with now. Is this really what I want to be working with? Is this really, like, to, to whose dream am I contributing and what, what is my contribution? <laughs> and I, it started to catch up with me around when I was around 30, that um, I don't really want to be, a, a, you know, a, a skin product salesman, which is really what I was. Uh, or clothing sale, you know, I was contributing to magazines that were selling advertising for makeup and clothing. And, and I was like, mm -hmm. this is not why I got into photography and this is not really who I am. Um, and then I started doing more portraiture and then I, I found this uh, film festival, uh, Human Rights Watch uh, organized the film festival in New York. And so I went there every year and I was like, wow, this would be something to be able to, to explore all these different worlds and tell these stories. <clears throat> and in the middle of all of these ideas and thoughts, 9-11 um, happened. Um, and I was a, a witness to the, to the, the second plane. I, the, the first plane I saw it on TV and then I went up on the roof and looked across the, uh, the river to see the Twin Towers and, and then I saw the second plane. And that was really the beginning of my no longer being a, a child <laughs> uh, and, mm. and beginning to question things and, and beginning to ask, like, what, why, who are these people who did this? Why, how could it happen? There, there must be a reason for this. Not to say that there, it, there was a legitimate reason for it, but there must be a reason. And when I would listen to the news and, and listen to radio, nobody came up with uh, an answer that satisfied me the answers were silly. They were like, do you remember George Bush? He was like, um, they're evildoers. It was just silly. Mm -hmm. It was like as if we were in kindergarten or something. Yeah. They're evildoers. We're going to smoke them out of their holes. Uh, you're either with <laughs> us or you're with the terrorists. It was just so silly, the whole thing. And that's yeah. really when I began to... That hurried my uh, wanting to uh, understand the world better and and, and, and try to contribute and, and to no longer be a fashion photographer in New York. <laughs> mm. And uh, I can't remember now what the, what the question was. I started talking about this. It's too long. I'm supposed to be interviewing you. But yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good story, though. Mm. Like, what a powerful yeah. way to... Yeah, that's, mm. that's quite an experience. Mm. And do you feel... Now do you feel, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm interviewing you again, interviewing you again. <laughs> that's fine. We'll, we'll take turns. <laughs> that, that's what I get for trying to interview documentary filmmakers. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, get a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> um, do, you, do you feel that satisfaction or sense of purpose and meaning that you didn't 
doing fashion photography. Do you feel that now, doing the work with Campfire Stories? So the answer should be yes, probably, and I should say something really smart and clever, but the real truth for me is that uh, waking up uh, or like beginning to realize how the world works and, not, and doesn't work is really a, a, a sorrow-filled um, endeavor for me. So, so waking up has not come with uh, chimes and uh, lovely uh, yoga music in the background. Um, it's, it's come with, with a, a big heap of depression. Um, mm. But in, in facing that, there's also the, the promise of actually feeling like I'm, I'm actually doing something that, um, I don't know, I can't say that it contributes, I can't say that it, it does good, but I can say that I'm doing my best to the best of my ability. I'm, I'm using the, the gifts that I've been gifted um, and, and I'm trying to, to do something with them, mm. Uh, mm. To, to, to go in the direction where if I'm just close my eyes and feel like, what, what can I do? What's the best I can do? Uh, yeah, this, at this chapter in my life, this is the best that I can do. So mm. Mm. that's the slightly longer answer. Mm. Which leads yeah. me, and I'm going to take back the interviewing hat, if that's okay, for a second. Because <laughs> it leads me into a question that I had for you guys. Because this is a question that I ask myself often. Um, because, yeah, in, in, in my best moments, I feel like I'm really contributing and doing something positive. And as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, modern uh, storyteller around the, uh, around the fire, um, but there are times when I feel like, why don't I do something that actually makes a difference? Why don't I stop this nonsense of trying to make films? Maybe that's just an excuse for me to do what I like to do. And why don't I just go and clean up a beach? Or why don't I just go and, and, and help people and, and do something that is real? Um, so with that setup, <laughs> sorry for that setup, <laughs> how do you feel, like, what do you feel that S uh, storytelling means or, or can um, how should I phrase this like what what can storytelling in the modern world do to help to help uh, step into a more ecological or, or less of a footprint world uh, mm. so we can hand mm. something positive to future generations mm. Mm. yeah I, I, th I think about this a lot as well of like you know, are we, is this the right thing to be doing with our time and our energy? Like, should we be actually, you know, chaining ourselves to things and, you know, cleaning up beaches and, and all that, um, you know, actual practical stuff. Um, and there's a sense of, yeah, like, is this, are we just kind of justifying what we like to do with like, oh, it's, you know, we must be doing something good, hopefully. <laughs> but I think that's, um, I think those doubts kind of dissolve when we see the feedback that we get from the films. Mm. I think that really mm. keeps us going and makes, it kind of validates these, um, these, these feelings of we are contributing to something bigger and playing our part with the skills that we have we get a lot of comments from people feeling, yeah, just really grateful that there's some positive stories being told, some solutions focused stories. I think people are really wanting practical um, actions that they can take and they want something to hope for because there's so much despair and, um, and worry around the future, mm. which is, you know, valid, of course. Mm. But that's kind of where the, the, the story can end a lot of the time, especially with news and on social media. You know, a lot of people now are just kind of resigned to humanity is going to go extinct in the next 10, 20, 30 years. There's no hope. There's nothing. There's no point of doing anything. And so they just carry on as normal in, in a kind of despair mode which is also a story in itself. Mm. That's a, a destructive story, I think, because 
it hasn't happened yet and we don't know what the future holds. But if we believe that, then it's kind of, it's written in. If we decide to do nothing as, as humanity, then yes, we will eventually destroy ourselves. Hmm. So, self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, self-fulfilling prophecy. So I guess what we're trying to do is be the, the counter to that and say and provide a i guess a vision for what the future could look like through through these stories through, mm. through filming with people who are um living in a different way i guess we're trying to give a taste of what a more beautiful world to borrow charles eisenstein's phrase could look like because i think that can be a lot of, can be a struggle for people and can be a part of the problem is that there's no alternative to the doom and despair and 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 if there's no hope then nothing will change and so by by giving these examples and showing that things can be done and that it can be done on an individual level i think is really empowering Mm. and i think we tend to see that with the comments that that Mm. come in yeah we had someone write yesterday and he sent us a um a hundred dollar donation and he's, yeah. a, he's a young new zealand guy um it was such a, it's so lovely when someone when a complete stranger sends you a, a generous donation mm. um because your work has affected it had an impact on him and he said you know i um i've watched i've watched all your films and I've got, and when when I have days of despair, I've got a few go-to films that I just come back to, and I watch those, and then I feel a little bit more hope, and like I can kind of get on and um, and make the changes in my own life. And it's like that, like we sat, we were sitting on the couch reading this email together, and we're both like it's it it has an emotional impact mm. Um, mm. to read to read that because it's like okay, we are actually doing something that's. Um, that people are telling us straight away, you know, has an impact. I know when I was in 2007, I um, read a book. So this was my kind of moment. I'd always had a little bit of a, a, a greeny kind of bent to my, I, I'd wanted to save the whales and dolphins when I was a teenager and mm. the rainforests. And it was a very kind of um, surface level of um, uh, environmentalism. And I didn't really understand the issues. Um, and I read a book that had uh, that, that that was my epiphany moment, and it really turned my life around. And I wish now that I'd written to the to the author and said thank you so much for completely changing my worldview. Um, and so, and having had that experience, um, I know that when I, in fact I should write to her. <laughs> still can. I still can, even if it's over ten years later. Um, so, so yeah, when people do write to us, when the, when people actually take the time to sit down and write an email and say that, then you know that it really is something that you you are really mm, reaching people. Um, like I said before, I do have moments of um, of real despair, and I sort of think, you know, we we're growing our food, and we're um, we're part of our local time bank, not particularly active, but um, we um, we're very connected with sort of people in this space and always sort of trying to build our our resilience through, you know, our community network. Um, so we are kind of doing things at a personal level. Mm. But um, but then, you know, um, when there's a when there's something big happening um, and we haven't where we could be involved on an activist level and we haven't been, it's usually been because we've been busy making a film. Mm. <laughs> and there is that real sense of is it more important to be here reaching this self-imposed deadline or to be out there picking up waste on the beach when a huge storm um, brought uh, opened up a land um, a landfill and spread decades of rubbish on a beautiful beach, uh, which was a, a, a terrible thing that happened in New Zealand last year. Um, and so many people went there to, um, to help pick up that waste, which seemed almost futile because there was just so much of it and people are still out there picking it up months and months later. Mm. Um, and we were on, we were, we had this, um, we were in the middle of Fools and Dreamers. And uh, yeah, like how do you sort of weigh that up and are we doing enough and is it, is this, is it enough to, yeah. to just put films out, which we love doing and you do feel a, a level of guilt because you're doing something you love doing. I mean, we're so privileged to, mm. 
to do what we love and do it in the in the way that we love doing it with no one sort of uh, applying pressure about how we do it or mm. in what time frame we do it. You know, we, we are incredibly privileged. Mm. Um, so, yes, yeah, so some guilt comes along with that because... Um, but I guess that's the... I guess that's the dilemma of our time. I, probably that applies to, yeah. to people not only who are working with what they love to do, but maybe mm. that applies to everybody who go to the supermarket mm. and they see that, uh, all right, I, I bought uh, uh, organic milk, but I didn't buy the organic raisins. Uh, or like, I'm sure probably <laughs> a lot of people recognize themselves that, that uh, oh, I could do more. So there's that guilt yeah. hanging over us, and, and maybe rightfully mm. so. Maybe future generations will look back and say, yeah, you know, um, you, you're not going to get like a medal for, that, for all that organic milk you bought, okay? There were like a lot of things <laughs> that you could have done. Yeah. I think yeah. it's, because uh, it's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting, I, I think about this a lot, um, you know, our, by our purchasing decisions, our lifestyle decisions, the privilege that we have that we can make those decisions. We we don't we our income is is very low in comparison to um, probably the average, I guess, for um, people doing what we do because we choose to to do it um, to be YouTubers and to release most of our films for free. In the same way that um, that you're working, there's a you, th there's a compromise that you make mm. um, to live more frugally in order to do it the way that you want to do it. So. So we do have a, a, a low income, but we live, but because of the way that we choose to live, I feel that we live very well and that we are really, really privileged. But I think a lot about, um, you know, the, the majority of people in the world don't have the, the even have the, the privilege of being able to choose to make by their purchasing decisions around um, these questions, and that thinking about that can really make you. Uh, I think what I feel is that the most important thing we can have is an attitude shift, mm. more than you know whether we, whether we angst over whether we can afford to buy organic milk or non-organic milk or whatever, um, is the most important thing that we can be doing is is thinking differently about how we live in the world. And if we can't buy or make organic milk because we can't afford it, we can still be um, we can still be talking about how we live in the world. To, uh, to, to the people around us and we can still be creating other ways of um, being more connected um, to what's happening in the world. It doesn't all have to be around your purchasing decisions. Right. And I think we can, and those of us who are middle class and privileged can get very caught up in that, you know, what, what often becomes kind of greenwashing of, you know, like, you know, yeah. I've got my stylish keep cup and so therefore I'm, um, I'm, um, I can feel good about myself. Um, I think it's far more important to think about how you're thinking and how you're talking, how you're communicating about all of this with um, other people than angsting about purchasing decisions. And I, and I say that from years of experience of, <laughs> of being very focused on my purchasing decisions. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm. But, I yeah, feel like sometimes... Like you, oh. oh, I was just going to add to that, like Go ahead. What, you touched on, what you touched on though of like you know, just making films isn't enough, we feel. Like, you know, we have, to, it's really important to us to live the message that we're putting out there because it feels like the right thing to do. So, you know, like we're, we're trying to grow as much food as we can. We try to use the purchasing power that we have to support the industries that we want to support and see, um, see thrive. You know, we're doing our best to be as low waste as possible. Um, we're yeah conscious around our consumption mm. um, and I think that's a really important foundation for us to not just you know put this message out there but to also live it because that would feel that would feel very hypocritical yeah. um, and wouldn't feel right either mm. Mm. Yeah. but it's also empowering to live like that I mean it's yeah. very empowering yeah it's how we to... would live anyway yeah. even if we weren't making films this would be how we'd live yeah right yeah mm. I feel like sometimes it's it's not because if it, if I imagine the, let's call it the perfect me, who who has zero um, uh, zero waste and live the, the the perfect ecological life with zero footprint uh, of any kind, if I imagine that person and and what that would entail, 
um, and all the changes that I would have to make. Uh, and I, I probably can't even imagine, but if I really sat down to try and imagine what I would have to do, uh, that thought it leaves me depressed because it's out of reach. Yeah. I feel like that's, I, I, it's, it feels impossible. So instead, I've, I'm trying to think of it as, uh, as a direction. Um, so like checking the compass needle and, 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 and stopping and, and not being sure about things, taking in different sides and listening and, um, and, and just really calibrating that compass and taking a small step and asking myself, what is my next step that feels right? Mm -hmm. uh, so just recently, because um, I've been driving around this old Volvo for, from, I have to throw in Volvo there because I'm Swedish, <laughs> from 1994, <laughs> a real gas guzzler. Um, so I've been driving that around and I have about eight kilometers from my home to my office. So I start a cold car and drive eight kilometers and, and work and then I drive home. It's been really weighing on my conscience, uh, um, and I've, it just hasn't felt right. Uh, but I also have to drop off my daughter. Uh, it used to be I drop, off, uh, drop her off at daycare, and now I drop her off at school. So I was like, I can't, if I bike, I, it's, I'm just gonna, it's gonna be so tiring, and I couldn't imagine doing it. And then suddenly just it inched closer and closer and closer. And finally, I got um, an electric bike with uh, one of those big boxes in the front where you can put your child or some groceries and stuff. Now, I'm not saying that an electrical bicycle necessarily is great for the environment because God knows where that battery came from and so on. Yeah. Um, but I'm guessing, I'm taking a wild guess here, that it's a few steps better than my old 1994 Volvo that weighs like <laughs> one and a half tons and yeah so I'm, I'm I'm thinking it's a step in the right direction so that was yeah. something that inched closer and then became available as an option and became fun and seemed like yes it was a, it, it became a big big yes within me instead mm -hmm. of this depressed sort of oh am I really gonna have to start I really like having milk in my coffee but i know i should use the vegan option but it doesn't taste quite as good so just like yeah not rushing into being good <laughs> but yeah. but but setting the direction and maybe this yeah. is mm. terrible a terrible way of seeing it but that's the that's the closest that's that seems more right to me for for me to, to try yeah, to yeah. always question, what am I doing now? What's going on here? What's all this packaging? What's, do I, oh, this is one, I'm gonna ask you this one. Do I really need that new computer? Do I really need that new <laughs> camera, that new microphone? Um, tech stuff. So I've been yeah. working with these old, my camera is like almost 10 years old now on my computer. And I just recently got a new computer. But how, throwing that back to you, how do you mm. think about it's tech? A big one. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. It's because, yeah, like essentially, we rely on technology and this global supply chain of dubious materials to give us the equipment to do what we do. Mm. Um, and yeah, there's I I because I do most of the buying of gear and things. Um, <laughs> It's a question that like everything I buy, it's almost exhausting because I have to go through this like mental <laughs> checklist of like, okay, is this worth it? Is, um, well, first I try to buy it secondhand, but I can almost never find what I need secondhand here in New Zealand. There's just not a big camera market um, of, you know, certain things. So I do end up buying more than I'd like new. But then there are things like, um, like cameras, like do we, do we upgrade cameras? And okay, I can't buy this, this camera here secondhand. Is it worth buying new? And then recently I thought I made the decision. Yes, okay, gonna, gonna buy a new camera, which is, um, yeah, I've only ever had one other, or I've had two other new cameras, but I was less conscious about it then. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, buy as much secondhand as we can but then also being very conscious about when we do buy new, I think is is our, is our approach. Mm. Being being conscious of it and really thinking it through, I think is is critical. Yeah. Another thing that 
<clears throat> because as you'll know, there's there's a, a ridiculous number of little things you need to to get, you know, adapters and yeah, I mean, that's just, the stuff you can never find secondhand. No one sells yeah. like this particular piece of rig for this camera. <laughs> and then that comes with mountains of packaging. It's really yeah. difficult to um, to buy anything that doesn't come multiple ra multiply wrapped in plastic and mm. um, bubble. We had we've ordered something that came in, you know, in a, a box three times its size, filled with <laughs> bubble wrap. Yeah. And it's you know, luckily the lady at the post office was delighted to take it so that she mm. could give it to people for their Christmas presents. <laughs> but. Y y yeah, so there's this, there's, it's a constant thinking and battling and writing to people and saying, could you please send it in different packaging, which most of the time they can't because it's already packaged. Um, but I think the first, it's the consciousness, and second, it is actually writing to people and saying, because even if they can't send it to you with different packaging, they've heard that, and if they hear it from someone else and then they hear it seven times, um, apparently you learn after hearing things seven times, so maybe it'll work with businesses as well. They have, they, they have to make those, those changes. Um, if, if enough people demand it. Yeah. So I think that's part of it for us is it, it, it's a tiny little form of activism in, you know, if we can wrap it up in what we're doing in some way um, to... Or unwrap it. <laughs> <laughs> unwrap the plastic. <laughs> nice um, one, Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, so it, it's, a, it's a constant um, process for us mm. Of, mm. of being conscious and... Um, being present in in terms of, in everything that we um, making making sure that our lives our, that our um, ethics feed into everything that we do. Right. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. But like what you're touching on before, I think is a lot of these problems are systemic as well. Mm. So you can only do so much. You can only. Um, you know, we're operating within a system that doesn't make this easy. So there's always going to be compromises. Yeah. So like you, you riding or you needing to drive or buy an electric bike. Um, it's, I mean, it's similar here. Like we have a car that we need to drive into Christchurch to buy our groceries and do other things. Um, we do that once a week. We try to keep it to once a week, but you know, there's no train to go in there. We, we can't ride. We could we cycle could, three hours there yeah, and back. It would be a, a big day because <laughs> then you need to cycle around the city as well. So there's these kind of like systemic infrastructure challenges as well that make it just really hard because, you know, and relative to everything, petrol's pretty cheap as well. Like yeah. it should be more expensive really yeah. Yeah. for what it is. Yeah. And it makes things like, um, I mean, yeah, buying an electric bike is... Um, inaccessible for a lot of people because they are very expensive or buying an electric car and all these things as well they're so um they're out of reach they're out so of reach people. for a lot of people so yeah you can only do what you can do and you can only take your next step because you can't do everything at once yeah. you know, which is yeah i mean that's the approach we take as well like yeah. you know we didn't five years ago have an epiphany and everything was changed you know we it's we're been on a, a slow journey yeah every year you know we're mm. slowly making changes the latest one being trying to reduce waste um mm. but yeah it's because you also are constantly learning about what you can do as well and um getting new ideas and so mm. it's it's just it's always a journey and i don't know maybe in our lifetimes we'll never live sustainably or mm. never live within the resources of one planet but you know, we can work towards that, yeah. I think. I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you about the future of Happen Films. But before that, I just want to throw in, since I'm a, a, a newly uh, has become a, um, a proponent of biking instead of driving. So I will say that even <laughs> though an electric bike, uh, even a, a fancy one, that the one that I bought that was quite expensive, is not really expensive. If you compare, if you had a car and if you're, getting rid of your car and getting the bike, it takes a year and then it breaks even. And from there, it's yeah. only plus because you're not putting petrol yeah. in it and you're not taking it to, yeah. to have it serviced and stuff. So it's actually, yeah. it, it might be expensive at the time, but if like if you view it as a five-year investment, it's, it's mm. super, super, super cheap. And mm. it's delightful to ride to work, I've found. <laughs> even if it's snowing or raining or whatever, it's actually... I was riding the other day and I was like, it, the weather was awful. And I was like, 
it's actually really just the idea of being out biking in this terrible weather that's bad. The actual, like, what am I feeling right now? The senses that I'm actually feeling are, uh, are delightful. So that's my conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, there's so many other <laughs> benefits to that. Then, you know, you could narrow it down to carbon emissions, but that's a pretty narrow cost benefit, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. there's other things that come with it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. But I want to ask you about Happen Films. How, what, what, how do you envision that it will unfold? And let's, uh, let's take a sneak peek. Uh, so you just had your five-year anniversary. Let's say a 10-year anniversary sneak peek. What has happened? What, mm. what's, uh, what are your dreams? Yeah, we're you, a multinational. Be a, yeah, global corporation. <laughs> offices in most <laughs> countries. And the fees are hefty for watching your films, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're oh, not yeah. free. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, good we, good yeah. going, playing good guys for five years, really like paying yeah, your dues yeah. and then... Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, this is a big subject for us at the moment. We're, really, we're going through a process at the moment of, of thinking that through. What, what do we want to be? Where, do, where, where are we going? Um, we don't, I've, I've been part of a, um, in my, prior to um, filmmaking, I was in the book publishing industry and I've been in a um, part of a business that grew too quickly um, and then fell through. And so that was a really good experience for me to, um, to see how badly it can go if you try to grow too quickly. And goodness knows, we talk a lot about growth and, uh, and it's negative. So um, we, def we, we, we have no ambitions to, to grow as a, as a, business but we um well sort of exponentially but we do have a real um a really strong desire to work with a team because it's been the two of us for five years and we have um a couple of amazing mentors um that we video call with once a month and we have a, a fabulous friend who um does second camera for us on some of our shoots but otherwise it's literally you know the two of us 24 7 and it's work home and work is all combined and it's having films is kind of our life um it would be really lovely to bring in a couple of people to um to work with not just to ease on ease up the workload but to exchange ideas and creativity and so we're really looking forward to that that's our our mission we've just um made a connection this weekend with someone who's um, keen to come on board as a, an editor to work with us, um, and we're we're looking, uh, we're about to go out looking for someone to work with us in social media because it's not our forte, um, and that's an area that we really need to uh, develop quite quickly. Um, so, yeah, so it's yeah, like con it's, conscious growth. It is yeah. like not growth for the sake of it. I think a lot of small businesses or people getting into having a small business. It's that's what you do. You need. 10 employees from the get-go, you need all this money so you get into debt and you just grow because you think you need all these people and that's what you do. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're not trying to do. We're trying to grow when we need to and mm -hmm. not, you know, try, try not to get into debt as well. Yeah, we have, we have no debt personally or as a business and we, and we don't intend to ever go into debt. That's a, a kind of an ethical position. Um, we, our earnings are from um, our awesome Patreon um, supporters, uh, YouTube views because our movies, uh, all of our films are monetized, and donations from um, beautiful people around the world every now and then. And we've got one v film that's pay to view, which is um, about, around about sort of ten dollars to buy, and and we sell community screenings. So all of that sort of. You know that's that's our income. So we we just haven't been. I mean, we barely pay ourselves. Um, we we pay ourselves enough to kind of buy the groceries um, and and pay the rent. Um, so bringing somebody else on board hasn't been an option at all. Um, but now we're sort of yeah really thinking about how like we live in such an interesting world. You know, um, there there are lots of different. I mean, we've had so many people volunteer their help. Our mentors volunteer their help. Um, and so it's really sort of rethinking, you know, how can we begin this process? Because we want we want to be paid um, f for for the, for the work that we do, uh, so that when we don't sort of anticipate being millionaires, but we do want to be really comfortable, and we want to be able to bring people on board and 
pay them well for the work that they do. Um, so that's our kind of dream is to, is to have a team that, that of people who are living well and thriving and, and loving being part of this. Mm. Yeah, and providing um, work that's meaningful yeah. for other people. Like when we have contracted work with people, it's, yeah, it's always awesome to hear that they, they feel a sense of like, yeah, purpose and are just really passionate about the project because it is, you know, not, not everything they do is in line with, you know, changing the world or, you know, highlighting beautiful stories. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's amazing to be able to give those opportunities to people mm. as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's yeah. our... Um, that's a, a, a mission for this year is to uh, bring on a couple of people and, and start sort of creating a team. Mm. Mm. And another mission for this year, because we ha something we sort of haven't been able to do as a team of two is to um, release films really regularly. We'd like to get to a stage of releasing a film every month um, in order to be more engaged with our, or, or more sort of connected with our audience because they're, they're, they're sort of developing that sense of um, consistency and regularity mm. um, rather than putting out a film every few months um, yeah we want to we want to sort of be more present um, in the in the space that we're creating via our website and our YouTube channel um, mm. so so that's a mission for this year as well which is quite exciting mm. and we're just about to well kind of last week we decided on our next project like we like to have kind of like a, a, a bigger project going alongside the usual content that comes out um, and, and thinking about, I mean, this is a, a big thing for us in trying to decide what stories to tell next because it's a similar thing of like, where do we direct our energy? What's, um, what feels right? What, you know, what stories need to be told and where mm -hmm. can we be the most effective? And so we've just, um, earlier last year we were thinking, um, a film, a feature film, or a series of short films, or a half hour film. We went through like all the options you could think of <laughs> to um, make a, a, a film about regenerative agriculture. And it just didn't come together for us. It was kind of like a, it was a bit of a struggle to find the right people and the right connections and the decide on like a story and a, a framework for it. Even and though we were really excited, even though we're, even though and we're still, still really, really excited, excited about, about it. it, so we've kind of put that on the back burner, and we will do something around that going forward because we feel like that's you know agriculture is such a big part of the problem, but you know there's so many. It's also a big part of the solution. Solutions out there yeah. at the moment, people are really like pioneering some exciting things in the space. Mm. So that's kind of out there. We've got that in the back of our minds for, for people who will meet this year, um, but the. What we're doing next is a, a f what's probably going to be a five-part series of ten to fifteen-minute films, um, sharing indigenous stories. So, filming with Māori people here in New Zealand and sharing that knowledge and worldview in a similar style to our, the films we already release of people making change um, in all these different areas of food and housing and community. So, really, kind of blending those two and, and amplifying these really important voices and, mm. and stories. I think there's a, a, a growing understanding of um, how much um, traditional cultures that are, that are still holding on to their traditional values and um, knowledge um, to, to the extent to which we've not just ignored them but, but actually um, suppressed them. Um, and how much they have to teach and how much we can learn from them. And there's, a, a, there's not only a growing understanding of that, there's a growing acceptance of it and a real interest in exploring um, that, or that, that sort of suppressed knowledge and, um, and uh, re, yeah, reconnecting through that knowledge. Mm. And the Māori culture has uh, started a, a sort of a renaissance back in the 70s and it's, a, it's been a... Um, uh, a, a, probably a too slow um, development of re relearning and um, an understanding of what was lost over a, um, over a hundred years or more, mm. and it's a it, yeah, it's a really, it's just a really exciting um, time, and 
yeah, we're, we're going through a, a, a big learning space, uh, learning phase of um, learning language, learning cultural um, values, um, reconnecting, and and yeah, hopefully through this film series, being able to share that um, more broadly, the really uh, wonderful things that are coming out of um, yeah, that are ha that are happening here in New Zealand, that I think will be uh, really important learnings for anybody anywhere in the world. Mm. Mm. It's, so it sounds like a little bit of a departure from the uh, a, a classical Happen Films film is about uh, uh, permaculture or uh, uh, waste free living or compo compost, composting toilets and stuff like that. So this is a little bit of a, a new area maybe. It's the same yeah. area. Yeah. So, so for example, here in New Zealand, there's a movement called Parakore, which is the Māori waste free movement. And so it's waste-free in the same way that, that anybody does waste-free, but it's waste-free from within the worldview of Māori, and that has its own connotations um, and its own, um, uh, I guess, sort of philosophical and ethical um, background that I think we can learn from um, and uh, take from in a way that... Um, just adds a, a, just brings, yeah, it, it adds a different um, dimension, dimension to, yeah. to yeah. what we're already doing. Mm. So it's very similar. It, it's, they'll be very similar films. In this case, we're hoping to take the production value up a notch by seeking funding for them, mm. which we don't usually do for our short films. Mm. So we're, we're seeking, we're going to be seeking funding for the whole project, and that will help us to um, bring on board a, um, a consultant to make sure that we. Um, approach the whole subject appropriately and um, and also to um, yeah pay it pay an editor to work with us um, yeah it's it, it's a project that we really want to invest a lot in we really want to do um, real justice to the yeah to the to the subject mm. and it's all it's all s just similar to it's with all within like the what we've been doing but, you know, a lot of these things have different names, but they're all kind of touching on the same thing, whether you call it permaculture, whether you, you call it hua paracore, whether you call it, call it whatever, they're all kind of, you know, they all have their own unique attributes, but they're all within the same thing and they're all kind of touching on the same, mm. you know, reconnecting with the land, mm. living more sustainably, living more in community, um, so all these similar themes, but yeah, with an added kind of dimension and something that's really important for us is to is focusing on the interconnectedness of of all of these things. You know, no, like mm. not just talking about the waste free movement or just talking about composting toilets, which is one of our favourite subjects, well, one of my favourite subjects anyway. Um, you know, that as it on its own, it's such it, it's such a critical. I feel it's such a critical thing to be doing. Um, it's such a, an important level of responsibility, taking care of, of waste in a, uh, in a responsible way. Um, but it's connected to everything. It's, it's, it's connected to everything else that we're talking about in our films. Mm. And what I love about um, coming at the films from a perspective of, for example, um, Māori culture, is that that's already so embedded in their cultural values and that, that, inter that interconnectedness of everything. Mm. Um, and that's, what I, that's the message that we really want to share is that all, it's all connected um, and, and fundamentally there's, there, are, there are some really, there are core issues that we can deal with more uh, successfully if we acknowledge that interconnectedness of mm. everything. It's almost like that disconnection I think is kind of the root mm. of all these problems. And I think, you know, Charles Eisenstein speaks to this in his, his work, which has been hugely influential on us. Um, and we were lucky enough to interview him. But I think, yeah, things like climate change, things like um, extinction, all these issues, it all comes back to being disconnected from our place in the world and to each other and to the web of life. Um, and so I guess, yeah, we're trying to explore how, how to reconnect to that mm. as like a starting point to then, okay, then how do I live if I believe these things? If I believe I'm a part of a web of life and that the health of me depends on everything else, 
okay, then how do I eat? How do I, you know, what do I do with my waste? How do I live in the world if that's my kind of underlying belief and philosophy? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that we have um, the inspiration from Charles Eisenstein in common. Uh, and I was so jealous of you when I saw that in your outreach you said that you had interviewed him and there's a new film coming out and you know, I saw some clips and I was like... <laughs> <laughs> and then I heard that he was coming to Sweden. Not only was he coming to Sweden, he was coming to my town, which is not even a town, it's this really small place. And he was coming <laughs> right here to, to give a presentation and I was like, mm. wow. So I reached out and and then I was also able to get my own Charles Eisenstein <laughs> interview, <laughs> which was awesome. So then I was like, yeah. okay, Happen Films one, Campfire Stories one. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've gone on to do quite a bit of work with Charles, haven't you? It's, yeah, I made a long interview and then he said that, uh, oh, I'm so sick of uh, filmmakers who just use like five minutes of uh, an hour and a half interview and then they chop the rest and you never hear it or see it anywhere. Mm. So that was the beginning. Then I was like, hmm, let me release the whole thing. You had also released an entire, your mm. entire interview with him, I noticed. Yeah. So, and yeah. then I was like, let me, I'll make little um, episodes and release every question that I asked, the full answer as an episode. Um, mm. And then, so then I was in contact with him and his team to just to send and say, oh, I've just released this. You can check it out if you'd like. Um, and then um, they actually asked me if I wanted to be part of the team to, because they were um, doing the same thing with a whole bunch of material, including your interview. They had all yeah. these different yeah. interviews and they wanted to create 60 second snippets. And so they asked if I wanted to be one of the editors to, to work on that. Mm. And I said, yes. So I, I did that for a while. Um, I, I don't do it anymore, but I did that for maybe six months or something. And it was really mm. cool to be, to be part of the yeah. team. And, um, yeah. So yeah, that mm. was that was wonderful. Yeah. Do you do you find that the the right people in the right stories kind of present themselves when when the universe wants that story told? Kind of like I mean that's kind of like a guiding thing a little bit for us of like mm. that's where it kind of got stuck with the regenerative egg thing. It was just being too much of a struggle, and now yep. with this new series, it's like. Oh, things are falling into place. Yeah, We're meeting just, the right yeah. people. Like yeah. the ideas are coming and the opportunities are kind of presenting themselves. So it's like, okay, universe, is this what, is this what we're meant to do next? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll be okay. honest. I read your newsletter where you said that we're thinking about the new film and we thought like this and this and this, and uh, we calculated that this was the, the proper topic. And, and I, I read that and I was like, yeah, that's not how I work at all. I, I kind of bypass <laughs> the brain altogether. So I was like, mm. that's great that they're doing this, but it's it was too brainy of an approach for me. It's yeah. too much of an Excel sheet. Like, what's the, we need to have this ingredient and this and this. Mm. My films, it's just the floodgates of inspiration that have opened since, uh, yeah, it's it started with Charles Eisenstein's book, The Ascent of Humanity and moving to the country and deciding that uh, I'm not going to be uh, part of the film business anymore. I'm going mm. to be doing it a, in a different way. And then I read this, um, the, the second book that I read of Charles was Sacred Economics, uh, where he talks a lot about gift economy. And I was mm. like, yeah, that's, that seems right. So I'm going to use gift economy. It's going to be, uh, it's not going to be free, but it, it'll be a gift. And then if people want to gift me in return, that's fine. Um, what was the question? <laughs> now I got all lost uh, here. <laughs> the source of inspiration. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. So that's uh, synchronous. So yeah. It, it just uh, inspire. I have inspiration for like ten films, and I just treat these voices of inspiration that scream at me like children. Mm. Um, and wh whoever. Uh, this is not going to sound very good, but whatever child screams the loudest gets the more, most attention. <laughs> that's a terrible analogy, but uh, that's, that's how it works. So the, the idea that really yeah. screams loudly, I put, I'm like, okay, we're going to do you first. And you're not screaming so much, so we'll, we'll wait. Maybe I'll even forget about you and see if you come back or not. 
Um, and that's how it goes. And, and that's also why yeah. I think campfire stories, films are not really necessarily, they don't necessarily make sense if you think you're going to tune in to watch like a how-to or like what's mm. the next step to like they yeah you know you've seen some of them they they are a little bit yeah. all over yeah. the place maybe but uh, i don't know i'm just following what seems right and following my heart yeah. which is yeah. wonderful yeah 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 i think that's that's the way to do it and that's where we got stuck with that regenerative ag film and yeah, yeah that newsletter that you read is a <laughs> the outcome of that where we got stuck you know we had the inspiration it was flooding but then we thought too much. We thought too much about it. Yeah, we thought for a couple of months about it. Mm. And then it was just, it was like, okay, this obviously isn't happening. Let's just put it on the shelf and come back to it when it does come naturally. And so many people are working on regenerative ag films at the moment. Like every corner, you know, we'd come across somebody else working on it, which isn't, doesn't deter us from, from making a film. I think it's great that, um, I think it's a subject, mm. like many subjects that you bring it on like as many films as possible because every one of them is going to have a different perspective um, and say and say something you know equally important probably um, but it but it, but it also kind of was like okay well we can leave this because lots of people are taking care of it and um, and so we don't have to because I felt a sort of a sense of I often feel kind of like a sense of urgency and responsibility like we've got to tell the story because it's really urgent and it's important and people need to know um, and so it was nice to be able to step back from that and go, okay, well, we don't, I just don't actually have to think about that anymore. Um, it'll happen in good time, in the way that it's supposed to. Um, yeah, and 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 now that we've done that, everything else is just falling into place. It's, we, it's good to have that experience now and then to, mm. to have the universe remind you to stop forcing. Yeah, and when can we expect the first instalment of the series? Oh, you're gonna make us put a date on it that's gonna Yeah, no deadlines. Not... <laughs> oh. 2020. <laughs> It'll be mid year. Yeah. Yeah. We we start shooting in March. So um yeah. Uh, I mean it's so it's such early days really to even be talking about it actually. Um yeah, we I don't, we don't feel change like... our minds. Well yeah, I don't think we'll change our <laughs> no. minds, but I don't feel that it's succinctly um developed yet as a uh as an overall concept it's just but it's just a it's a an idea that feels right and feels timely and and feels um exciting to be beginning on yeah and it's like a it's like a journey of creating this thing because it's not like we come up with the idea find the five people we're going to film with and write a script for about it like it's a kind of evolving thing like we've got this idea we've got a few people we'd like to film with but it's very much kind of like take a step work it out, take a step, you know. Mm. 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 Yeah. 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 Similar with like, uh, it just made me think about like, I don't know, making change in your life in general of, you know, doing what feels right next and what you're excited about. Like, you know, if you, if, if, you know, someone's watching our films and isn't sure, you know, well, what do I do? Or do I grow some food? Do I try to go zero waste? Do I do this or that? Because there's so much you can do, and you've got to start somewhere. Mm. I think it's it's good to start where what what feels right and what feels and what you're excited about. Because if you're not excited about it, then maybe it's not the right thing to be doing next. Maybe it's not the next step you need to take. Mm. Like, right? If maybe you know you really feel like you need to get your hands in the soil, so you you're going to grow something, and that's that's your first step, and that's what you then build from to be like, okay, I've, I've done that now. You know, what else excites me? Oh, okay, maybe I'm going to reduce the amount of plastic or something like that. Mm. Mm. That's how we yeah, approach that as well. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Mm. So we've mentioned Charles Eisenstein a, a few times. Um, do you have uh, any, anybody else at the moment who inspires you? Uh, could be a, a writer or another filmmaker or music or so like a little tip mm. or a, a podcast or something? that I can mm. dive into right away when mm. we finish this. <laughs> <laughs> well, apart from your films, Matthias, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, I don't know, there's always a lot of, there's a lot of people. I know, someone who always stands out to me is, um, you probably know Rob Greenfield. Yep. He's a um, mm. guy in the, in the States who might actually be 
venturing out this way yeah. this year it'd be so yeah. good to meet him in person because we want to film with him but again it's that distance like you know do we take a plane over there to film with him um but i always find him a nice breath of fresh air on social media because he's so honest and he sh he shares kind of the struggles with the journey he's on um and he's just he's just living really radically not in a way to say that everybody needs to live like that but just kind of like to make people question like okay well, yeah how much stuff do i need in my life how much money do i need mm. um yeah he's very radical and, and very inspiring and very honest as well so i always find him yeah a pleasure to mm. see online yeah i'm um i'm very deeply embedded in four books at the moment but they're all uh te maori which is the coming from um yeah, that indigenous New Zealand perspective uh, on I'm I'm relearning a I'm relearning the history of New Zealand because I wasn't taught it um, properly at school, which is the case in so many colonised cultures. Um, so so that's yeah that's very much my my mm. space at the moment. I yep. yeah um, I don't think that yeah I can't think of yeah that, i'm so i'm so i'm so kind of inspired by that at the moment that's mm. yeah that's where my head's at yeah we've got a lot of new books coming in the mail going, <laughs> going on at the moment. Yeah. a lot of library books a lot of uh <laughs> bought books yeah it's mm, it's interesting i love the research stage of a new project i love the diving diving deeply into it and yeah mm. is that fun. sort of your role in happen films the the researcher the structuring uh person yeah that's Yep, the research, uh, and I'm uh, my main role is producer and email writer because somebody else, somebody around here doesn't like writing emails. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, but but George, yeah, we're very much um, like I'll I'll begin the research and then George will dive into it, um, and then when we're shooting, George's you're the director, but I tend to. I'm, I'm sort of very much there. George's 100% behind the camera and, and the editing. So, yeah, we, there's a lot of writing we share. Mm. Um, yeah, we share a lot uh, where we can. And then, um, yeah, I, I guess uh, we're very much a, a duo in mm. the... In the mm. I cannot wait to see your next film. And I can't <laughs> believe you're going to make me wait until... <laughs> for another six months, but uh, I'll have to rewatch. There, there will be other stuff in yeah, the meantime. We've, we've got other stuff coming out. We've got a new permaculture tour coming out mm. uh, very soon, yeah. so that'll be exciting. We're looking forward to that one. Maybe. And also, if you're into vans, we've got a separate van channel, camper vans. Um, I, I saw your first well. one, uh, the, the one that you made. That was really yeah. cool. But yeah, I don't know I if I'm you. into it enough to see, because the, the other ones are not... <laughs> I want to see you like making stuff and the two of you going yeah. into well, the we bush. Will be. <laughs> yeah. Well, as part of um, because because we travel in New Zealand a lot for filming, we need like a comfortable vehicle to travel in, um, and we've actually just bought or we we bought. We're in the but, process of buying. Yeah, about to pick up um, a little box truck that we're going to be converting into a camper that mm -hmm. we'll be filming the process of. So that'll be a fun project and it will nice. be kind of a mo <laughs> little mobile home studio base while we um, go and, and go and film these stories. So yeah, we're excited about that. Yeah. Cool. Long term, our plan is to run it off um, veggie oil. So yeah. it's, yeah, it's a big, it's a big long term project. It's, it's fun. It's quite exciting. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> All right, well, before I set you free to do whatever you uh, are going to do today and before I set myself free to strike the set and go put myself to bed <laughs> because it's getting late here. It's um, getting late, yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what did I miss? What did I forget to ask? What do you want to ask? What's the, what, what, where do we, where do we, how do we end this? Mm. Or do we just go, bye-bye? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, should, should we just give it a... Give people because yeah, your audience is going to be watching this. Our audience is going to be watching this. Like, should we just you know reel off a few links to go look at things? Yeah. Um, so where can what, what people it, find your work? And what's your favorite? What's your favorite stuff from your own work at the moment? 
Like, what are you most excited for people to see? I'm, I'm most excited for people to see the, the, the three films that I'm going to be releasing in the next few months. Um, cool. I'll yeah. give a brief breakdown. But I always, when people ask what I do and I try to explain, and they say, well, where should I begin? What should I watch first? Um, usually I tell them that you can begin with the film that I call An Unlearning, which is the one that I, where I mentioned that I interviewed Charles Eisenstein, because that sort of explains me a little bit, like my background, how did I, like what, what types of questions did I carry into adulthood unanswered and, mm. uh, and in which way did Charles work answer them and then the fact that I may, that I meet him and and then also he sings a little bit in the end which is nice Charles Eisenstein singing in the end <laughs> it's always no, nice. we didn't get into singing <laughs> we're gonna have to do another interview where he sings um, so that's a good one to, to start off with um, and yeah I'm actually I, I have a short film coming out uh, in a few months which uh, the English title will be uh, on compassion and it's actually a filmed version of an essay of Charles Eisenstein. So um, the essay oh, cool. is called, the title is, What's it like to be you? And it's sort of about polarization and about how can you put yourself in the shoes of the person that you feel is your opponent or you're even somebody you hate. Um, and oh, I'm so glad you're doing mm. that. That's such a, I, I love that subject. I think that's such a good subject to highlight. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just I read that article, uh, the essay of his, and I immediately knew how to turn that into a film. And wow, and cool. strangely enough, Swedish television, um, I sent it to them, and they I did not expect them to to pick it up, but they are on board as co-producers. So it's going to be wow. broadcast. Nice. It'll be the first co-production between Campfire Stories and Swedish national television. So that'll oh, be, have the opportunity to get a bigger uh, audience. Uh, at least here cool. locally. So that's cool. Mm. Uh, so I think that should be coming out in March or April. Um, I have a film about forestry coming out uh, in March, I think. Um, which, because there were ads on TV in Sweden from the forestry people saying that they were doing a great job and that it's so environmentally friendly what they're doing and, and all the, the smart f products that they can make from, from woods is wonderful. And I was like, ah, yeah, that sounds great. But it, it, that, it just didn't sit right with me. I, I had no, I didn't know anything about forestry, but I, or I, I should say I knew one thing about forestry. And that is the fact that whenever I would go into the woods and I would come to an area, a clear cut area, I would feel tremendous sadness and I just feel that the, mm. something is wrong here. But then when you, uh, when you hear the, the commercials and see the ads and everything, they just make it sound like and make it seem like that's, uh, that's the way to do it. And this is great for, for, for this is progress and this is wonderful. And you can mm. make biofuel and you can make all these things. Instead of plastic things, you make it out of yeah, whatever they make it sound really great but I was like yes yeah. yeah I didn't buy it and so the mm. this film is called a tale from the woods and uh, I meet I've interviewed five different people that are really experts on ecoforestry and uh, biology and um, mm. all these different topics and uh, it, it yeah. turns out that it's a horrific idea to clear cut forests and replant mm. them and I have uh, for so-called forests that are really just tree plantations where every uh, individual tree is the same size and the same age um, mm. and it makes them not able to collaborate and makes them uh, much more vulnerable to fires and to uh, storms and to um, insects and, and so it's it's a it's really insane. really bad idea also economically but somehow mm. the the forestry mafia in Sweden hasn't realized that yet but that's one that i'm really excited about and maybe i'll mm. leave the third one i won't sp speak about that now because it'll, <laughs> it's coming out in may or june and i haven't even started editing but i will say that it's about <laughs> it's about following your heart and that's all i will say about that nice cool yeah looking forward to seeing it yeah, yeah. oh and there's cool. this really cool podcast coming out uh well when whoever is listening now is listening to it it has already come out 
and it will happen <laughs> films uh, Antoinette and, and Jordan the, the dynamic duo from Down Under <laughs> I like it yeah that should be our new that should be our new tagline <laughs> forget stories for a changing world the dynamic duo from Down Under I like it <laughs> <laughs> Cool. And where can people find those films and your existing films? Uh, Campfire-stories, plural, dot org. Uh, cool. Or if I did all the SEO work correctly, they should just be able to just put in Ecosia or Google or whatever they use, Campfire Stories. If that doesn't help, mm-hmm. but Campfire Stories films, hopefully something will come up. But yeah, campfire-stories.org. Yep. Cool. And whoever is listening on my end, who perhaps has never heard of you, they go to happenfilms.com. Yeah, yep. Yep. happenfilms.com has all our stuff up there. Or if you're already on YouTube, you can just search Happen Films and that's where all our work goes. Mm. Yep. But we're, we're everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, all that fun stuff. We're there, we're not necessarily... We're there, we post every now and again. <laughs> the dynamic duo from Down Under are everywhere, you heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> all right well Good. thank you so much for allowing me to 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 um, take up this entire uh, breakfast time for you or whatever time it is over there now <laughs> oh tell me bef- go, going on lunch be- before we uh, say goodbye what's uh, what are you doing today what's on the schedule uh I'll probably send you these files <laughs> <laughs> I am in the process of, so with this new project that we've got coming up, I'm in the process of writing a treatment. So um, I've got a, a deadline of uh, late February. Um, we're going to an uh, event where we'll have an opportunity to um, let people know that uh, we're seeking funding. So, um, so yeah, that's my next few weeks, actually, writing a treatment, which is always, yeah, just trying to... Um, Get this, get this idea really nutted out. And, and um, if, if somebody listening now wants to contribute to the film, what do they do? Well, we'll probably put a newsletter out about this to our mailing list. So um, if people are interested in following along, they can sign up to the newsletter at uh, happenfilms.com and we'll have yeah, more, more info about that as the project develops. Yeah, and we also always welcome um, emails directly from our website, from the contact form on our website. Um, We respond pretty quickly to those. So, Mm. yeah, always happy hearing from people. Yeah, nice. Mm. All right, well, thank you so very much for this lovely conversation. And And thank you for the idea. Yeah, Yeah. thanks so much for having us on. It's been so nice to chat. Yeah, Yeah. loved it. Um, And, man... Six months, really? But okay, I'm going to get into, into <laughs> patience mode and see whatever comes out in, in between. So that'll be good. Yeah, ditto. Yeah, yeah, really looking forward to seeing what comes next from you. Yeah. Exciting projects. Take care. Keep doing what you're doing. I love your work and just please keep it up and uh, can't wait to see the next one. Same mm, to you. Yeah. Thanks, Matthias. Bye. Bye. See ya. <laughs>